Okay, hi everyone. It's Jeremy Blackman from the Alana and Madeline Foundation. Thanks for joining us for this afternoon's webinar uh, in eSmart Week. So I'm just going to give people a chance to arrive for the next couple of minutes and then we're going to kick things off. So if you have any issues hearing me, you can you can go to the panel uh, on your right and stick up your hand and we'll hopefully be able to give you some advice on um, you know, sorting out whatever issues you're having. Um, and likewise, if you're not hearing us, if you're not hearing me clearly, just by, by all means let us know and we'll try and sort that out. So I'll give that a try. For those of you who have arrived already, maybe just Go to the panel and stick up your hand if you can hear me and it's all okay. Yep, thank you. A few hands going up. Thanks. Great. That's good. Uh, I did a webinar yesterday morning. Uh, I think in the first minute or two, I was, someone told me I was sounding like I was underwater. So it's good that I'm <laughs> not today. So that's good. All right, we might kick things off. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, this is the the third webinar of eSmart Week, and and today we actually have a special guest uh, who's actually at Swinburne University at the moment, uh, the author and academic Anthony McCosker, who has recently published a book called Negotiating Digital Citizenship, which is a fascinating read, and it really covers a whole, a wide range of, of perspectives on that very kind of complex idea of what citizenship is and what digital citizenship is. So, uh, welcome, Anthony. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, we also have on uh, co-pilot with me um, Sandra Craig, who is the, the manager of the National Centre Against Bullying, and she will she'll be here. She might chip in occasionally with the odd uh, deep insight, um, but she's also here to you know answer some questions. If you have any questions. Uh, feel free to write them in. So welcome, Sandra. Welcome to everybody, and uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. Now I'm controlling the, the the actual PowerPoint. So Anthony, if you, if I'm being a bit sluggish with the controls and moving on, just just give me the hurry up. So we might start with your book. Sure. Do you want to tell us about? Um, I guess what was the what was the reason for for writing it and how it kind of evolved? Um, oh, it's a good question. It's um, something that I've been thinking about for a long time, probably five or six years, um, but it really something really sparked for me when I was at a conference in Estonia. Um, weirdly, it was a youth studies conference, uh, the Nordic Youth Studies Conference, and I was talking about um, young people's engagement with digital culture, and um, I was using the the concept of cultural citizenship. Um, the way that we um, uh, kind of enact and embody forms of citizenship by the way that we act culturally. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a concept in sociology and cultural studies um, and in media studies that, that I'm quite familiar with. But many of the people there at the conference um, were from parts of uh, the Baltic states or former Baltic states, the, the um, former USSR, um, Russia, and those areas that have been massively affected by um, questions of citizenship. And they were completely gobsmacked and, um, you know, um, confused by this idea of cultural citizenship and the idea of digital citizenship on top of that. and. It, it really got me thinking, well, what do we mean by this? Um, digital citizenship as a term was starting to be used um, quite commonly around five, six, seven years ago as a way of talking about the way that we govern uh, our online activities. And um, I, th I think it was kind of used as shorthand um, for 
I don't know, ways of controlling what we can do online, the kind of platforms that, that were emerging, um, social media environments, etc. And I was kind of just initially interested in clarifying all of these ideas. Um, so really, the book itself came about by conversations with a whole range of really amazing researchers, um, thinking about similar questions, but from a whole heap of different perspectives. Uh, and I wanted to bring it all together around, um, yeah, around a, a collection that could make sense of digital citizenship. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I think at the foundation, we we often, you know, with our eSmart program, we often, we've had kind of internal conversations around this idea of digital citizenship and we've, you know, we've tried to put together a number of, you know, position statements on and definitions on what it is. Um, and I think we, we're, I think we're, we're often, I guess, um, yeah, we're kind of perplexed at times and maybe a bit frustrated that um, digital citizenship has been kind of co-opted, this idea of, or kind of reduced in its definition to, to I don't know, like being nice to each other and and yeah. um, especially in especially in the realm where we work, which is you know young people in various contexts. And I noticed um, in your in, in your early chapter in the book, you do kind of talk about that idea of how you know it does re it does take out some of those broader ideas of participation um, when mm -hmm. we're thinking about citizenship more broadly. So. Um, yeah, do you have any kind of comment? I know you're going to talk about some of that yeah. uh, throughout the pre presentation. No, no, that's 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 absolutely part of the starting point, and that's that's the um, uh, that's why I wanted the the word negotiating in there as well, mm -hmm. because um, yeah, I, I I've always had a bit of an issue with the way that um, yeah, so digital citizenship as a concept has been used as something that's almost always imposed as a top-down process. Um, or as a set of rules for appropriate behaviour um, and that kind of thing. But if we think about it from below, from the idea of citizenship, what it means to participate, um, to be included or excluded um, from a society, and then think about that um, in terms of our digital technologies and digital platforms, then there's something more enabling and more powerful, I think, that's possible with the term, so, and I think this is a this is a kind of ongoing project. Um, you know, I think it's I've I've just seen it as a concept that needs to be rescued sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, you're right. It's really difficult to define. It's really difficult to pin down. And I think that's partly because these processes, like like all aspects of the governance of society, um, are contested, uh, and they're cultural. So all of these elements have become part of what um, the book is all about. Um, we're particularly interested in the productive possibilities of of being part of a society, of, of being um, connected, of being able to produce and have a voice and all of those kind of things. Yeah, great. I should mention before we continue that I first met Anthony, um, I was putting together a panel for the Australian Internet Governance Forum, uh, I think it was back in... 2014, um, looking at trolling, which was mm. which has come and gone as an issue, uh, and at the time it was a really um, hotly contested issue because of some notable, um, uh, so, you know, celebrity incidents regarding trolling. So, you know, mm. so yeah, so Anthony, I think you were on that panel and talking about you know, these very ideas of of the, and the nuance of different kinds of uh, not just tro you know trolling itself, but uh, yeah, different ways of participating. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, that's that's been one of my um, interests and research focus. Just looking at that issue of conflict. You know, when we have um, it's, when we have technologies that allow uh, social um, engagement and interaction, um, you know, right from the beginning of the internet, uh, conflict has been an important part of that. It, and it's it's funny you should say. Um, I'll mention that trolling is an issue that, that's sort of come and go, gone. I think that the terms come and go, but uh, the issues have been there, um, especially if you look at the research, for 25 years, nearly 30 years now, um, we've been researching these issues. We've called it all sorts of different things, flaming, um, mm. trolling, um, it, but it's also harassment and it's also bullying and it's also all sorts of other things as well, or just or racism or misogyny and 
mm. um, you know, a whole range of things. They're they're all really important parts to me of um, of how um, online participation in society is negotiated. Um, I don't think there are any easy solution to those kind of issues um, and processes, uh, but we need to keep looking for them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I heard um, I heard an American um, digital media expert, quite a quite a kind of um, well known. I can't I actually can't remember his name to be honest, but he was talking about <laughs> this kind of revolutionary idea of saying, all right, we've we've kind of the internet's amazing, but we need to um, I think we've learned quite a lot, and we need to just ditch this version of it and just start again. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's, it's kind of a kind of pipe dream to just get rid of yeah. the elements that aren't quite working and keep all the rest that is. But um, yeah, I think when you think about kind of conflict and all these different elements, it's 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 tempting to think about it in those idealistic terms. Yeah, just get a big whiteboard and um, put up all the pros and cons and just keep the pros. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah. let's let's move on to the next slide. Um, so looking at, yeah, looking at digital citizenship and the way you approach it, I suppose. Yeah. So this is um, this this is our starting point. So some one of the big, um, I guess, uh, shifts in the way that academics have thought about the concept of digital citizenship um, came with a uh, a really well well researched book by Karen Mossberger and and her colleagues in the U.S. Um, essentially, their book was looking at um, the benefits to society as a whole of um, of internet and digital media use, and it it was kind of at about that time where there was a realization that well, as um, health services, government services, welfare, education have started to embrace digital technologies, there's the real possibility of people getting left behind. So. Um, you know that kind of went along with um, these other concepts of digital a digital divide, um, digital mm -hmm. inclusion and exclusion. Um, so it was really about this idea of uh, access, um, access to society through um, digital technologies. And I think it's really important, and it really is an instigator for a whole range of programs. I guess including your own there at AMF, um, where you know, we, we kind of recognise the importance for young people to be able to, to participate in society through digital digital technologies, um, but to do so in a way that's you know that's um, empowering and and um, and safe and productive and all of those kind of things. Yeah, I um, think that we've now got the digital inclusion index, haven't we? I think I think it's been yeah. you've been yeah. working with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um that's a collaboration between Swinburne, uh, Telstra. Um, who have funded, who's funded the Digital Inclusion Index and um, now RMIT as well. Um, and that, that really looks at a whole range of issues. Access to technologies is one of those um, issues, um, but also digital abilities and attitudes um, and a range of issues around infrastructure and so on. The idea of that is to, to try to map um, geographically uh, in terms of demographics, um, yeah, who who falls outside the the um, who f falls outside the net essentially, uh, and it's really important work because it gives us a sense that you know it's it's not an even playing field really, uh, it's by no means even. Um, so we have to continually work at the gaps and work at those who are who are falling behind, whether it's. Um, seniors, old people, or um, people with disabilities who might find access um, difficult in different ways, um, or um, young people in particular as well who need to kind of learn and, and move into those processes. Yeah, interesting. Yep. So, so the idea of um, so the idea here of with the slide on the screen is that we're we're kind of moving towards. Um, and our book is is an attempt to to move towards a new um, a, a new way of thinking about um, the possibilities or the potential of of um, thinking about digital citizenship and 
acting on digital citizenship and um, doing so in terms of three key th key um, key things, key key elements. Uh, the way that we govern internet um, and social media use, internet platforms, and so on, is increasingly complex in a in a you know kind of globalized um, world uh, where it's really difficult to actually you know have some sort of impact on what um, Facebook does in the U.S. Um, but has an impact on us here. Uh, the contested acts and behaviours. Uh, mm. the way that people use digital tools, and then the productive possibilities and cultures of use and collective action. Uh, um, so looking at all of those three things, are, uh, our way of rethinking what digital citizenship can be, what, you know, the potential um, in the concept, I think. Do you think, uh, I'll stick to the, the last point there about productive cultures and collective action. Um, you know, there's, there was peri we've gone through periods of lots of criticism about, you know, uh, collectivism and slacktivism and, and those yeah. kinds of things as well. Do you think? Do you think the? I mean, we see lots of amazing initiatives in all kinds of different platforms. Mm -hmm. um, do you mm -hmm. think? Do you think um, the public discourse around those kinds of positive benefits are, are kind of underplayed, or do you, or do you think um, yeah. the value of that collective action online is 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 not as you know, the value is not as great as, as we might hope. Yeah. Look, um, uh, a little bit both ways. Um, I think we have to. I think the point is uh, to continually experiment and push the boundaries in terms of those um, those kind of actions. Um, I to to give an example. Um, I actually was involved in a court case, um, a VCAT case that was about. Um, saving one of Melbourne's um, iconic venues, the Palace Theatre, um, where the um, community uh, community group was working hard over about three years to to save the building from developers. You know the the very typical scenario that we see um, time and time again, where it's about community action. You know, trying to Trying to retain something of value, of community value, of social value, um, uh, working against developers, etc. Um, my job in the court case was to look at the um, the Facebook data of the group involved in saving the Palace Theatre and um, and try to explain and visualise and use data analysis to show the, the, so, the real social value, the, the way that people value the building. And, you know, you could say that the data that I was looking at were clicks. They were clicks and likes and comments and things like that. But all together over a three-year period, they added up to a lot. And um, now um, we didn't win the case, but the court absolutely accepted that, you know, there was a value to that to that community action through social media. Um, you know, the courts rely on things like petitions to, to demonstrate social value. So um, mm. I definitely do think that, you know, we downplay collectivism, but um, I think erroneously, I think we actually need to um, stand up. And, and I think, you know, this is really important for young people who believe in causes or um, mm. or issues and, you know, in particular things like marriage equality at the moment where um, it really is something that um, getting online and talking about it, it ha has an effect. It, it has an effect on um, the way people think about these things, um, their knowledge, um, you know, all of, all of that. Has a flow-on effect, for sure. Yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, whoops, too fast there. So I think you broke it into three areas. Is that right? So mm. self control. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Now this is um, this is yeah the the three aspects of the book: control, contest, and and culture. Um, the idea was to to not be um to not be too negative about all of this and not not to remain too critical, I guess, but um, but our concept of digital citizenship is to really think about the multi-directional um, aspects of 
um, of these processes. Um, so the section that's about control um, is about we've got to acknowledge that there are a bunch of top-down processes uh, that do have an effect on our digital environments. Um, they have a direct effect and they can be a number of things. They can be uh, the protocols and codes and just simply the features um, that are available through, say, you know, a, a social media platform. The way that, that Facebook sets up its, um, its features and limitations has a big effect on how it's used, um, what it's used for, and the interactions that take place and the way that we can be social online. Um, so, you know, just really simple things, for example, like not having a dislike button is a, is a massively powerful, um, or it has massively powerful implications for how we interact. You know, the, you can imagine if there was a dislike button, how um, it, there would be an increased kind of negative interaction um, process that, uh, that would have an effect. Um, but so we have to think about all of those kinds of things, but also the role that governments play. Um, we've seen in Australia actually some really interesting moves in this area. So the setting up of the the office for the Children's Sea Safety Commissioner, for example, um, it's actually quite uh, I don't know cutting edge globally uh, in terms of trying to impose, what it, what it does is that it tries to impose local controls or national controls on services that are not at all in any way based in Australia and therefore not, um, not directly under Australian control. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, this is, a, this is a huge issue, like for us dealing with certain, dealing with schools and cyberbullying issues early on. Um, yeah, yeah uh, in terms of yeah, they're all all these websites are offshore, and um, yeah. how, do you, how do you get any kind of meaningful response when they're dealing with this huge volume of content? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, there's the volume of content. So you know, um, YouTube comments, for example, it's incredibly difficult to mm. for YouTube even to to um, to develop the technology that's sophisticated enough to pick up on. Um, you know, on vitriol and, and racism and those kind of things. Um, so they rely on flagging processes and they rely on users um, uh, and they rely on blocking systems and things like that. But it is, it is interesting what um, our office, our commissioner here is doing um, with the partnership system. So they're really trying to get uh, these platforms on board to come up with their own measures for for safety and, and security. So um, one really interesting example is Ask FM, which has been a notorious, um, a notorious, I guess, you know, messaging and social um, site for young people and for, for school kids in particular. Uh, partly it was originally a Latvian um, uh, based service. Um, but the issue was, of course, the anonymity, um, the and then the bullying and, and so on that ensues, the the localness of it. So, um, you know, so it was really targeting kids in particular areas and particular schools and so on. Yeah, we've, but, we've had a number of conversations with um, startup companies looking to set up various like social media platforms in that vein. Um, yeah. and I remember there's one. Um, probably a couple of years ago, Sandra, I think we yeah. met with... It was uh, fascinating, actually. And I won't give away the actual name for it, but it was basically as simple as the website was called, you know, Love, Hate, and the okay. dynamic was it was set up in anonymity, similar to Ask FM, and basically the only interaction was to love or hate people's <laughs> posts. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> and at least, you know, he, he came to us asking for advice on... How this might play out with younger audiences. And, um, yeah, he was astonished yeah. when he found out that bullying might ensue. <laughs> yeah, look, and it's funny. I've had similar conversations. Um, we have uh, students who try to set up services in the same way, um, and yeah, there's just no forethought for the um, for the 
for the flow and effects. But but with Ask FM, it was interesting because when it was uh, it was bought by a, a company that's now based in Dublin, I think, um, and uh, they completely redid its safety mechanisms uh, to allow uh, really quite a sophisticated level of blocking and um, uh, yeah, just just those kind of mechanisms that can help you know deal with those issues. Mm -hmm. And um, they've subsequently been given a, a tier one um, rating by our uh, commissioner mm -hmm. here. So you know, like, so th this is these are all aspects of these control processes where um, they are a negotiation between services that that do want to exist. You know, um, they they don't want to be mired in uh, in conflict and and bullying and those kind of things. Um, so they do, to an extent, want to work with um, with people who are trying to set up good governance structures, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then moving on to control mechanisms, which we've probably touched on already, of course. Yeah, yeah. Look, this is just a diagram of the of the way that all of these things connect together. So w what I should add there is that um, there's a really important element, the civil society element there, um, organisations, NGOs, um, you know, including AMF, um, the work that you guys do um, in schools, school teachers themselves, um, you know, people in libraries, um, but also parents, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole level of, uh, this is what I mean by the, the kind of multi-directional uh, nature of, of these aspects of digital citizenship, that, that it's not something that's necessarily just imposed from the top down or that we have to accept, um, you know, in terms of the way that platforms set up their, their systems. Uh, we can always push back, we can always work things out. Um, there's a, basically, we're kind of advocating for this whole of community approach, but it, it already is mm -hmm. one. Um, there, there already is one there. You know, all of these processes are kind of negotiating with each other at each point. Um, so we, yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is the work that we have to continue to do. I think. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so then, moving on to contest. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I noticed the first word they've got is empowerment, and we often, with, you, know, you know, in this, in our work with young people, trying to move to that kind of strengths-based perspective, I suppose, rather than risk-based, and I, I guess yeah. the whole industry is trying to move towards that generally. Yeah, I, and, and I think it's really difficult as well. Um, it's, I think this is the... Um, the, the contest element is the, the hardest one to talk about. So, I, I, yeah, I do do a fair bit of, um, uh, you know, sort of conference work and a lot of my research is around either activism or um, trolling and, and racism and those kind of things. And it's, it's actually incredibly difficult to talk about in um, positive ways. So I do like to put the idea of empowerment up front, um, but I also like to use this word um, agonism uh, instead of antagonism. Uh, it's, it's a word that recognises that in society we can never completely eliminate contest or antagonism, um, but what we want to do is move towards a situation where we can uh, have those contests on an even playing field without the kind of violent um, implications or outcomes, uh, where it's a, con a proper contest between equals, um, where uh, it's you know responsible and moderated and and all of those kind of things. Um, so that's that's possibly idealistic, but. Um, the, the key point, I think, is to is to think about the fact that uh, contest is always going to be there, um, and it can be at the really negative end, um, the harassment, the trolling, the stalking. Um, mm -hmm. We've got to try to remove the the um, the facilitators of those things, really, uh, as much as a, possible. Anthony, is there an example of a platform or a space on the internet that you think? 
it does that better than others. Like, I mean, it's an example where it's yeah, it's kind of moderated and there's free. There's, there's a balance of free speech and differing views. Um, if you come across, because I know like when you're talking about um, you know, broader platforms that are very, just very public, I often think about. It always reminds me of you know if you're at the I don't know if you're at the MCG on grand final day and it's just this huge crowd of just everyone yelling at the same time. Is, is there a better a platform that does it better, do you think? Or? Oh, look, um, yeah, there are better and worse ones. I think Twitter is um, really problematic for a lot of reasons. Um, it's probably at the worst end, um, mainly because of its publicness. It's really based in, you know, being open and public and it's a, you know, it, it can in a lot of cases become a shout fest. Um, mm. And, and it's hard to control because of the very simple structure, um, the way that it's set up. Um, Facebook, in terms of its private um, private offerings, uh, as in um, uh, private networks, is actually, I think, quite effective. So um, where you have moderated groups, where you have... Um, yeah, where you have private networks where it's conversation between... Um, friends that have accepted each other, uh, that helps a lot um, because there's a mutual there's a mutual kind of um, uh, connection there that 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 helps. Uh, yeah, it's look. very hard. To, it's very hard to substitute that that kind of um, you know a lot of the work we do is in it, it always comes back to relationship mm. building <laughs> and relate. It's very hard to sub. It's very hard to substitute that in an environment where. There's lots of anonymity, and you don't have a genuine connection with somebody. Yeah, it's very difficult. yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. That's it's the genuine connection that's important. And I've actually um, come to find uh, forums, moderated forums in particular, um, work really well, where they're interest based, and um, right. you know, where they, where they serve that purpose of taking people out of their ordinary social media, um, you know. Um, lives and where they like to be, I don't know, you know, <laughs> brash or um, say politically incorrect things and whatever, mm -hmm. but really, really control the conversation a little bit better. I, I think those kind of platforms do work work well. Yeah, yeah. I think it's probably a whole. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of social experiments happening all over the place that. That mm -hmm. are in that vein, so yeah, it's, it's probably yep. lots of interesting work still going on in that yep. area. I think, and then and, of course, and, culture. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No, no. I just just to add, I think um, one of the reasons that it, that a lot of young people have moved to messaging apps, so just using WhatsApp or um, you know anything like that that's a little bit more one to one um, or um, or small groups or small networks. I think that's the reason. You know, it's it's to be able to control those um, conversations and interactions a little bit better. It doesn't always work well, but um, but that's that's absolutely part of the reason. Yeah, Sandra was Sandra's a bit of a, a bit of a passion of San, San, Sandra's with us. She hasn't heard much of it. She's the um, manager of the National Centre Against Bullying. And she's telling me about some of the one of her passions is the ancient uh, Greeks and their society and Oh yes, yes. They're kind of forums, yeah. Yeah, I was I was looking at a program and it was it was really talking about the the um, opt in well not opt in really the the participatory democracy of ancient Athens, and yeah. you had six thousand people you know on the on the Penix and they were all participating, they were all shouting, they were all and ultimately they had to agree to go forward. And yeah, how yeah, they did that yeah. is a mystery to me. <laughs> <laughs> Something that we perhaps aim for on online. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I think, um, and I think that's why I like the the concept of forums generally. Just that that they are a, that they are they do kind of, you know, give us that hope that that people can have a voice, that they can say something and be heard, and you know, and that that, that there'll be some sort of outcome from that. <laughs> So uh, I just, oh, yeah, I just always hope that the outcome isn't that they're shouted down and that they never raise their voice again. That's, you know, well, do you have right. you done any research into the effects of of that, that negative kind of feedback? That sort of chilling effect. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've certainly seen it. I've certainly mm. seen it a lot. Um, and yeah, it can it can be quite. I mean, 
uh, it depends on the environment, it depends on the forum or the, the yeah. social site, um, but there can be that kind of mob mentality, absolutely. Yeah. And we've seen that with, you know, with the whole Gamergate um, experience with um, anyone who wants to, it, so gendered con conversations where, uh, you know, views get polarised really quickly, just way too quickly, and conversations get shut down and um, or become impossible. And yeah. You know, there's a, and I think this happens in Reddit a lot. If if you've ever spent time with Reddit, yeah. As, yeah. Um, you know, mainly US-based uh, forum, um, mainly young people, mainly college students, but it can be a really horrible environment in that sense. Uh, and yes, counterproductive. I, say, I, I think of Reddit as both fun and horrifying at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's yeah. it. That's yeah. yeah. I mean, so the first point on this culture slide is, yeah, that idea of cultural pluralism. I was thinking about Santa's mm -hmm. example of the ancient Greeks and, you know, 8,000 of them in a, you know, in a room dis <laughs> discussing issues. Maybe maybe one of their advantages was they had similar, at least, you know, real similar values in some respects or experiences yeah. of their society. And I'm, I'm wondering... Well, I mean, they were similar in that they, they weren't any women and they weren't right. any slaves. So it was, it was yeah. a sort of... Um, it was a cross. It was a cross-cultural population, but it was just uh, males, and it was just yeah. citizens. So yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, and probably probably relatively shared interests. Um, if there was, you know, conflict and debate, it probably wasn't too far away from each other. Um, no, I'm sure. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I do. I do think we forget. Um, um, or there's there's a kind of flattening that happens with social media platforms in the sense that they are global, they're globally networked, um, but we forget the local, we, get, we forget the, mm -hmm. the, the localness of our responses and our, and our experiences and, and our ability yeah. to participate. And, um, and sometimes it's, it's that localness that, that really um, yeah, causes issues. Um, but, but in terms of the book and this section um, and what we wanted to do with thinking about culture, um, we really wanted to look at the possibilities and the, and the potential and, and I want to emphasize that idea of creative experimentation um, and whether, you know, and this is something that I'm quite passionate about at the moment, uh, looking at the way that we can mix um, digital content creation skills, uh, things like um, you know, creating digital video or digital stories um, and sharing them and, um, you know, participating online in, in particular communities that are, that are targeted, accepting, um, you know, focused on, for instance, gender or sexuality issues or mm -hmm. ethnicity issues or um, so, um, you know, some of the work in, in our book looks at um, young Muslim uh, mm -hmm people's experiences of, of trying to, you know, combat stereotypes or um, avoid the kind of stigma that's building around, around their, their religion and their everyday activities. Uh, and I think there's, yeah, so, so we can look at, you know, how do we then create new tools? How do we leverage the tools that are, that are available? Um, how do we encourage participation in that sense? Uh, and this is this is very much about that trying to move away from the, the risk paradigm towards um, you know absolutely one that that's accepting that's pluralistic um, that's empowering uh, in all sorts of different contexts. Yeah, exactly. Um, look, I think we're probably out of time, Anthony. Unfortunately, <laughs> but. Um, hmm. You know, okay. we, could, um, we could definitely do a follow-up, I'm sure. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been no great worries. hearing you, Anthony. That's fascinating insights. It's been really great talking to you. Yeah, no, thanks for the conversation. Perfect. Mm. We and just a reminder, <laughs> yeah. And just a reminder that Anthony's um, book that he edited, and uh, I think you wrote two chapters in or one chapter? Yeah, yeah, a couple well, of chapters. Four, yeah. Okay. Yep. Couple of chapters. Um, is available. Where is it available, Anthony? Um, well, like anything, uh, you can get it through Amazon and um, Book Depository. They're probably the easiest um, outlets, um, or from the publisher, Roman and Littlefield. Uh, 
bookshops are a, a, in a, a an evaporating kind of entity. So <laughs> go to readings. Go to readings. <laughs> <laughs> readings for sure, definitely. Uh, but but outside of the yeah, the middle of Melbourne, it's uh, it's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Excellent. Well, we might wrap things up there. I'll just probably remind everyone: there's in East Smart Week, there's two more webinars to come. One, one is tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, which is on respectful communication online and off with Amy Williams, who works primarily with our digital license team. And then Friday, the final one is about East Smart communities, and that's with um, Judy Fallon, who's the manager for East Smart Schools, and Joe Whitford, who works with East Smart Libraries. So thanks to everyone for attending, and thanks again to Anthony and to Sandra. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Sandra. Okay. Thanks, everyone.